The listening section has three parts. Part 1. For short conversations, each followed by one question. Part 2. One longer conversation, followed by four questions. Part 3. One lecture, followed by six questions. You will hear each conversation or lecture only one time. You must answer each question before continuing. To continue to the next question, click the next button. In this section, you cannot use the back button to return to an earlier question. The number of questions and the amount of time you have to answer the questions will be shown separately for each section in the question time left window on your screen. Time is not counted while you are listening to the conversation or lecture. I like these chairs. How much are they? They are $60 each or $100 for the pair. How much does one chair cost? Excuse me, could you please tell me how to get to the University City Bank? Sure. Go straight for two blocks, then turn left and walk three more blocks until you get to the drugstore. It's right across the street. How far must the man walk to get to the bank? How did you and your dad like the football game yesterday? Oh, they played so poorly that we left at the halftime. How did the man and his father feel about the football game? Excuse me, nurse. I'm looking for the emergency room. I thought that it was on the first floor. It is. This is the basement. Take the elevator one flight up and turn left. Where did this conversation most probably take place? Listen to a conversation in a professor's office between a professor and a student. Good afternoon, Miss Pennington. You were in my um, American History 201 class, right? How can I help you today? It's about my term paper. I, uh, I know it's due next Monday, but um, I was hoping... I don't think I can get it done by then. 
Could I please turn it in by the end of next week instead? I have a really good excuse. Oh, I'm sure you do. I've been teaching 33 years. Do you know how many excuses I've heard? My dog ate my paper. My roommate had a party so I couldn't concentrate. I have seven papers due on the same day. I went home to see my parents and my car broke down. My favorite was a student who told me she forgot all about her term paper until the day before it was due. It's amazing she remembered to come to class. Uh, I didn't forget, sir. I've been working on the paper, really. Here, I brought my outline in a rough draft. It's, um, just that, well, a lot of things have been going on in my life, and I'm having trouble managing things. I see. You know, I assigned that paper four weeks ago, and I've been reminding students about it in each class. So tell me your story. What's happening in your life? First, about two weeks ago, my roommate found out her mother is real sick. She has breast cancer. So she's been really upset, and uh, I went home with her for a couple of days to see her mom. That caused me to miss biology lab, and I have a huge biology final coming up on Tuesday that I really need to study for this weekend. Then I got the flu last week and missed a day of class. I tried to work on your paper that day, but I felt really horrible. Okay, I can understand that. I'm glad that you're uh, helping your roommate through a tough time. That's more important than schoolwork. But all this seems to have happened recently. What about the two weeks after I first assigned the term paper? I, uh, I guess I didn't use that time very well. I kind of put off getting started on it. <sighs> yes, you did. You know, if I had a dollar for every time I heard a student say that. I'm sorry, Professor Dalton. I've learned my lesson. If I had spent just a little bit of time each week on that paper, I could have had it done on time. I know now that I need to plan for unexpected things. You seem like a bright, conscientious young lady, Miss... Your first name's Jill, isn't it? When I was a young student, an upperclassman gave me some advice that I've never forgotten. He said, you're going to find yourself with a lot of small gaps during school days, 15 minutes or half an hour. What you do during those gaps will make a big difference in how successful you are. Wow, that's great advice. Yeah, I thought so, and I still do. So I'll tell you what. You can turn your paper in no later than 9 a.m. on Friday, right here on my office desk. In exchange for this favor, I want you to pass that advice on to all your friends and dorm mates. Thank you, Professor Dalton. You bet I will. Um, as long as you're here, let me take a peek at your outline and rough draft. Do you have any questions about the paper that I can help you with? Question 1. Question 2. Question 3. Question 4.
Listen to part of a lecture in biology class. You've been reading about animal behavior. Today we'll discuss one of the most astonishing behaviors in the animal world, dancing bees. Did you know that bees can dance? Well, neither did scientists until the 1960s. That's when a German scientist named uh, Carl von Fritsch noticed something truly remarkable. As he was observing honeybees, he noticed that some of the bees, which he called scout bees, flew out of the hive to look for food. When a scout found a site where there was food, it flew back to the beehive and started dancing. This dance somehow told the other honeybees where the food was, because after the dance, the bees, some of the bees flew from the hive straight to the site of the food. Von Fritsch called the bees that collect the food forager bees. He thought the scout bees dance told the forager bees three things. First, the smell of the food it had found. Second, which direction to fly to reach the food. And third, the distance of the food site from the beehive. Von Fritsch won the 1973 Nobel Prize for this discovery, but many scientists were skeptical of his theory. They didn't believe it was the dance that led the forager bees to food. Instead, they thought it might be, oh, the smell of the food in the dancing bee, or maybe that they just followed the scout back to the food site. Well, very recently, some British scientists used a new type of radar to prove that von Fitch's theory was indeed correct. It is the dance that communicates this information to other bees. British researchers found that the scout bees perform two types of dances. If the food is near the hive, say, oh, about 50 or 60 meters away, the scout flies in a round pattern, like a circle. This tells the location, but not the direction of the food site. If the site is farther away, the scout does what's called a waggle dance. It flies in a pattern of ovals and vertical lines. The speed of the waggle dance tells other bees how far away the food site is. The slower the dance, the farther away the food. If the scout flies in a vertical line up the side of the beehive, it's telling the foragers to fly directly towards the sun. If the scout flies vertically down the hive, it's saying, fly away from the sun. Up is toward, down is away. If the scout flies at an angle to the hive, it's telling the foragers to fly neither toward nor away from the sun, but in between. The bees have a special internal mechanism to know which angle they should fly based on the sun, the hive, and the food site. They can also measure the distance they fly by recording the motion of things they see as they fly past. Now, um, one problem with Von Fitch's theory had been this. It seems to take the forager bees a long time to reach the food site. That's why, that's why scientists thought that perhaps it wasn't the waggle dance that led them there. For many years, scientists couldn't follow the foragers after they left the hive because they didn't have the technology. Just a few years ago, though, the British scientists solved this problem using a new type of radar. They were able to attach a, a small radio transmitter to forager bees. I don't know how, but they did. This enabled them to follow the forager bees' flight after they left the hive. The radar showed that foragers do, in fact, fly straight to the area of the food site. They don't follow the scout bee back to the site because the scout goes into the hive after it finishes dancing. Well then, if the waggle dance does lead the foragers directly to the food site, why does it take so long for them to find the actual food? The answer is that the waggle dance leads the foragers only to the general area of the food. It doesn't tell them the exact location of the flowers or plants that have the food. So the foragers have to spend a while flying around the area before they find the exact location of what they're looking for. 
Question 1. Question 2. Question 4. Question 5. Listen again to part of the lecture, then answer the question. Just a few years ago, though, the British scientists solved this problem using a new type of radar. They were able to attach a... a small radio transmitter to forager bees. I don't know how, but they did. Question 6.